Please rise. Grace, peace, and mercy unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning's message for this first Sunday in Lent, I've entitled it, More Than a Royal Visitor. Because Jesus is more than just any ordinary royal. He is the King of Kings, and yet he comes down to us to journey with us through a barren land and calls upon the powerful word to sustain us even as it sustained him. Let us pray. O oh, Heavenly Father, we see your Son, Jesus Christ, lead us forth through many wildernesses, even as he entered into the wilderness to suffer temptation, to suffer privation, all for our sakes. We pray, Lord, that we may take hold of the word as he took hold of the word, was able to fend off all of the temptations of Satan. May we thereby be inspired by his love for us in enduring all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Of course, it's a kind of a common theme that more than one royal personage has decided to go off and in covert company of commoners. James V of Scotland was known as, by that title, King of Commoners, as he would sometimes travel around Scotland disguised as Goodman of Ballingridge. There's a small statue on Stirling Castle of James V. He had donned there the garb of an ordinary farmer, and it's embedded into the castle walls. What motivated this king isn't all that surprising, really. It was sheer escapism, either from the responsibilities or the tedium or the scrutiny that comes with such a position as king. And when that moment of escape would run its course, he gladly returned to royal life with all of its trappings. How tempting it would be, yet how self-serving, because such adventures really accomplished nothing important for humanity, or for the world. But the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, he came down from the highest throne imaginable and beyond our imagination to dwell in the lowliest of positions possible. Born in Bethlehem, born in a manger, he lived as a refugee. He has great affinity of all of those refugees that are trying to get out of the Ukraine, Jesus knows the refugee experience and what it is to flee for your life. He's the son of a carpenter. But unlike worldly royals, he wasn't just visiting among us commoners for diversion. Jesus came down on high to accomplish a great mission. Jesus wouldn't simply return to the palace and all of the comforts that a palace would offer when the going got tough. He delved deeper. He delved harder into the human experience. Affirmed the Son of God on the banks of the Jordan River, he allowed himself to be led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit where he would fast for the 40 days. Jesus embraced poverty. He embraced utter hunger, humiliation right to the nth degree. Jesus did not play at being human. He didn't play at being a servant. He didn't don farmer's clothes for a moment to cast them off in a short order and resume his kingly garb. Jesus entered into the extremes of the human condition. He embraced extreme emotion. He wept. He embraced 
extreme suffering. He wept. Extreme loneliness, extreme temptation. He embraced all of these things for a purpose. Toward the close and climax of his atoning mission, it meant carrying the cross. It meant crucifixion on a cross. In such suffering, he was atoning for the sins of the whole world. And maybe that's a bit abstract, but put it in personal terms. He was atoning for your sin and my sin. And how earnestly did Satan tempt him to shirk all suffering and thereby shirk his salvific mission. And Satan came along in the midst of the greatest hunger imaginable and said, turn this stone into bread. No doubt, the devil's kind of subtle. The devil can be very articulate. The devil played the role of a wise counselor of state, I, I'd imagine. You know, it, it, there's words conveyed there. You know, I can imagine him saying, okay, really, your majesty, you've fasted for 40 days already. You've made your point. If there is a point, use your powers and save yourself. Stop the suffering. Turn these stones into bread. Take and eat. Satan didn't stop with a once temptation. Later on in his ministry, Peter became the tempter's voice when Jesus spoke of the necessity of the cross at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus said from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes, be killed on the third day, rise again from the dead. And what do his followers do? What does Peter say? Not so, Lord. Let nothing like that happen to you, Lord. And Jesus responded to Peter's temptation because it was inspired of the devil that came out of the wilderness. Get behind me, Satan. Even while on the cross, our Lord's mission nearly accomplished, the crowds were tempting. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. How ironic, really. Because to be the true son of God, to be the true savior of the world, he had to stay on that cross right to the bitter end. And really all the other temptations of the Christ, the worldly kingdoms, the angelic savings, were, were really focused in and around this theme, attempts to lure Jesus away from his ultimate mission of salvation, to lure Jesus away from his suffering and death on the cross. Thanks be to God that Jesus would not be deterred from his mission to suffer hunger, thirst, loneliness, even death itself. Jesus met Satan's temptation by saying, man cannot live on bread alone. Instead, humanity lives off of every word that comes from the very mouth of God. When you have the word of God, you have everything. You even have the source of all bread. Remember that the scripture Jesus quoted comes from the context of of God's people. They're going through the wilderness to the promised land and God gives them manna. And it's manna at God's word. It's manna that comes at God's command. And the word of God makes it clear that our life only comes by God's word. It only comes by Jesus living under the cross, moving towards the cross, for it is only in death that there can be a glorious resurrection. And we who are called to follow, living lives under the shadow of the cross, we, we must not shirk it, but instead embrace it. Each Christian is called to take up their cross and follow him. 
This is the sacrificial life. We do not live for ourselves, for our own comfort or our own glory. St. Paul picks up on this theme. What does he say? He says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more worthy than yourself, more significant than yourselves. Let each of you not look to your own interests all the time, but to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking upon himself a true servanthood, even a slave, as a slave being bored into the flesh of man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself, being obedient, even obedience to a cross. With Christ's work, there is salvation. In Christ's work, there is glory for our Lord. Paul says, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Rest assured that we who are in Jesus Christ. Paul uses that phrase so frequently. By the grace of God, we may enter into Christ. As we are in Christ, rest assured, there will be glory for us also who are following in his steps. But Satan will always be there to lure us away from our lives lived under the cross. Satan is always tempting us, saying, your offering today, it could be well used for yourself. It could be better spent on yourself a, a nice meal or some new clothes or trip to the movies or some such thing like that. That time you spend praying for the Sunday school or, or preparing a lesson, that might have been better time spent, you know, advancing your own career in a presentation that you might be making. And the most precious commodity, I think, in our society today is the commodity of time. Who doesn't hear that they're short on time? That three, four hours preparing for, participating in, traveling to and fro to the divine service. Satan presents us all the time a hundred different things you could be doing and to give them a higher priority, but resist the devil's temptations and he shall flee from you. Remember where your strength is. Your strength is in Jesus Christ who embraced his temptations without succumbing to them. He embraced his suffering. He embraced his cross, the entire salvific mission. Jesus was not just a royal visitor. He entered our world as the ultimate servant king. He wasn't here for a moment. Jesus was here for the long haul, and he's watching for us even now. The salvific work of Jesus wasn't just three hours on a good Friday or three years even for his earthly ministry or the 33 years of his earthly life. Salvation comes from the lamb, the lamb slain from the very foundations of the world. Now when I think of God's plan, and the time from all eternity that went into it, I see the love and care of our triune God to save us. Who couldn't be motivated by that? What great love there is. I stand in awe of Jesus' love for all of us this day. It is my prayer that after hearing what he did in the wilderness, we would stand in awe 
awe of his love, awe of his perseverance. And in such powerful love, follow Jesus in incredibly sacrificial lives this Lenten season. May it be so for all of us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please rise for a blessing.